Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Shannon McNulty. I'm the founder of the Village Law Firm and an estate planning attorney, and we focus on helping families and individuals in New York City uh, protect their loved ones and secure their legacies. Uh, so we're regularly working with families um, in terms of preparing them, helping them prepare both legally and financially in case something happened to them or their partner uh, to make sure that their kids are taken care of, that we have a guardian appointed, that there would be assets available, all of those things um, to put in place. And we really help want to make it a holistic plan so that if God forbid something happened, that there would be, everything would be in place and your kids would kind of have the best protection possible and your loved ones would have it would be as easy as possible for your loved ones. Uh, one of the components that, you know, I think is part of this preparedness is an emergency preparedness. So maybe something doesn't happen, um, sort of we don't need legal issues, but there are other things that can happen in an emergency. And as a New Yorker, a longtime New Yorker, I've kind of lived through many of these things that uh, can really upset of uh, the community and the family's arrangements of you're not able to drive somewhere, you're not able to get on the subway, um, your kids' schools closed down, how do you get them? You're not able to, uh, to, to get to where you need to be. You want to make sure your kids are safe. If you have to evacuate, what do you need in place? And so uh, I thought it was a good idea to bring in an expert in all of these things so that she could share with us um, what exactly do we need in these kinds of an emergencies, practically speaking, uh, and how can we best prepare to uh, protect ourselves and our families and our loved ones. So I'm really happy to have Kiara Solomon here with us today from New York City Emergency Management. And she's going to be giving a presentation on all of these things that we should do to be prepared, um, the things that we can have on hand and the planning that we should be doing. And I want to encourage you to ask any questions throughout. You can just put them in the chat and, and I will uh, go through them as we have opportunities. So um, Kiara, I'm really excited to have you with us. Thank you for joining. And I will let you uh, take it away from here. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for participating and having me here. I'm very excited to be here. So before I start, I'm going to drop a couple of links in the chat. Um, this will be some reference material that will be used in the presentation. All right, and I will share my screen. I'm gonna turn off my camera and share my screen just because I personally feel like videos can sometimes be distracting when presenting. So prayer with me. And I haven't or, anyway, I just want to make sure that the uh, the chat is is enabled because um, I'm getting a message that this is not enabled. So uh, can somebody just put something in the chat just to see if it's working? OK, got it. <laughs> it is working. So I'm glad yeah. to hear that. So uh, I have some it's disabled. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, only Q and A works. Okay, got it. Okay, so um, rephrase that. That don't put things in the chat. Put it in Q and A because I'm able to read that. So uh, if you have anything, just put it in Q and A, and we will we'll try to address it pretty timely. Okay, go ahead, Gary. Take it away. Great. So I'm ha can you stop sharing your screen and then I'll be able to share mine? Perfect. So, sorry, a bit too early for that. <laughs>
can I just get a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Um, I, I can see your screen. I think, I think we're good. So I'll get started. So thank you everyone for coming. My name is Kiara Solomon. I am here with New York City Emergency Management to discuss emergency preparedness today. So to start, who are we and what do we do? So um, out of curiosity, if you guys could put in the Q&A portion, has anyone ever heard of New York City Emergency Management? Right. Um, I'm not sure they're able to to respond here. Okay, I see some people in the in the Q and A section say no and yes. Okay. All right. So, New York City Emergency Management. We are the city agency that helps New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies through preparedness, education, and response. The agency is responsible for coordinating citywide emergency planning and response for all types and scales of emergencies, and is staffed by more than 200 individuals. And one of our primary um, missions of emergency management is preparedness, which is what we're here to do today. And some of our public facing programs in preparedness is Ready New York, which is the program that we are all participating in right now, which is the public education campaign of the agency, where we teach New Yorkers about individual preparedness. We have community preparedness. This helps local organizations build capacities in their own community to prepare for, respond to, or recover from an emergency. Simply put, this program is saying the community knows how to help itself best, so we help communities help themselves. And then we also have community emergency response team volunteers that are known as CERT. These are dedicated volunteers who undergo about a 10-week training course to provide basic response skills in emergency settings. Okay. Oh, a bit too far ahead. So that summarizes um, what the outreach programs we have. And today we are here to discuss the three basic steps to emergency preparedness. So step one to emergency preparedness is, is making a plan. Aspect two of being prepared is gathering supplies and aspect three of being prepared is staying informed. So before we go deeper into the presentation, I'd like to reference the piece of literature that we'll be referencing throughout the presentation. I dropped it in the chat before starting, and you can also find this material by the QR scan in the QR code here in the corner, or visiting nyc.gov slash ready New York and finding this guide as well. And it is available in the 13 most common spoken languages in New York City. And just to pipe in here, I did put the um, that information in the Q and A, so it's in the answered questions uh, where that you can find that information. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. So let's dive right in. So the first aspect of emergency preparedness is making a plan. First step of making a plan is creating an emergency support network. Does anyone here know how many people should be in your emergency support network bare minimum? If you could just put it in the Q&A portion, that'd be great. All right, I see I have a shy audience, no worries. So here at New York City Emergency Management, we encourage everyone to have at least two people in their so emergency support network. We encourage you to have someone, one in New York City and one outside of New York City. Your support network should could be family members, friends, neighbors, service providers, or home aides. And your emergency support contacts should know how to support you during an emergency, including how to communicate with you and how to use any life-sustaining equipment that you may need. A second important aspect of making a plan is writing down health and life-saving information. This can include writing down your medication, including the names, milligrams, and the need for each medication. And as well, write down any dietary restrictions you may have or any allergies. 
And other information that you can include can be like your blood type, a copy of your health insurance plan, and just information of important phone numbers in your life. So just numbers of your um, emergency contact is great as well. Additionally, it's important to have a transportation plan in case the subways and buses are not running, or maybe you might your emergency plan might be to call an Uber or to call a loved one who has a private vehicle to help transport you. Oh, and on the flip side, if you're someone who relies on private transportation, you may have to use the subway or the buses when you're not accustomed to doing so. So learn about your transportation options and know how to use all of them in the event of an emergency. Another aspect of emergency planning is knowing when to go and when to stay. If an emergency requires you to evacuate your home, leave immediately. Emergencies that require you to evacuate your home are typically um, sudden emergencies such as a fire when things are sudden and you, you just have to leave. And emergencies in which you typically stay at home is something we also refer to as sheltering in place would be typically during weather events such as a snowstorm or heat waves where outside is more unsafe than it is inside. In the event that you have to evacuate your home, um, New York City provides shelters and service centers. Um, emergency centers will be set up in schools, city buildings, and places of worship. Um, this is why it's important to stay informed via city resources like Notify NYC, which we'll talk about later. All shelters and service centers are accessible and allow pets and service animals. During a coastal storm or hurricane, an evacuation order may be issued for those living in a hurricane evacuation zone. If the city issues an evacuation order, evacuate as directed. This is why it's important to know your hurricane evacuation zone. And the way you can find out your hurricane evacuation zone is by knowing your zone. So New York City Emergency Management has a campaign called Know Your Zone. And in, by visiting the website nyc.gov slash know your zone, you can type in your address and it will show you which hurricane evacuation zone you live in. So there are six hurricane evacuation zones. Uh, zone one, which is the most severe, and it goes up to zone six, which is less severe. And if you look at the map, you'll also see a bunch of gray area, which is what can be considered as zone zero which is considered least severe. But what I like to say is that anywhere it rains, it can flood. And as such, it's essential to have an emergency plan regardless of where you live. And if you're someone who isn't tech savvy and you're not comfortable going to nyc.gov to find this information, you can call 311 and share your address with them and they can tell you which hurricane evacuation zone you live in. And it's also important to consider special circumstances for you. If you live in a basement apartment and you live in say hurricane zone six, you're more likely to experience flooding because you live below ground. So again, it's important to stay notified about what's going on in your community. And again, this is a different version of notify, I'm sorry, notify of know your zone. This is where you type in your address and then it shows you which hurricane zone you live in and the nearest shelters. So another aspect of emergency planning, as I mentioned before, is gathering supplies. So there's two types of supplies you should gather. One is a go bag. And in the go bag is things you'll need for the next three to seven days if you have to evacuate your home in a hurry. So the question is, who needs a go bag? Does anyone in the chat want to throw in an idea of who needs a go bag in your home under the Q&A portion? I'll give you guys like 10 seconds. I say, we say uh, the consensus seems to be everybody needs to have their own bag. That is correct. Everyone in the house does need a go bag. So you need a go bag, your dog needs a go bag, the baby needs a go bag. I know often people with young parents, I mean, sorry, with young children or elderly parents 
often want to just share a go bag, but it's important that everyone has their own go bag because everyone has their own needs. For example, you have an elderly parent, maybe they have a lot of medication that, that you can put in their bag and maybe you just have to hold their bag or like hold their bag if they're unable to carry it themselves because they have different needs than you. So um, we encourage everyone to change out their go bag seasonally as well, at least twice a year, once for the summer and spring, and again for the fall and winter. Ideally four times is best since seasons change. Um, there's four seasons, it's best to change it every four seasons to adjust to all your personal needs, but minimum twice a year. And this way you can adjust to go back with new needs that come with every season. So would anyone like to put in the um, Q&A items you would put in your go bag? Okay, well to start, there's, in this picture, there's a lot of items such as a first aid kit, some toiletries, glasses, and some money. So these are all items you can include in your go bag. And these are things that you need to last for three to seven days in case you have to leave your home. And other items you may want to include would be items of comfort. If you are a person of faith, you may want to include a copy of your Bible or a Torah or just a, li a literature of faith. If you have children in your life, maybe you would like to include a teddy bear so that they can have something to comfort them. Or maybe a video game if you if you're able to fit it in your bag, like a Nintendo Switch or a Game Boy, if you still have those, things to comfort you in the time of crisis are really important. In and addition, maybe, uh, I just suggest as well that like a, a phone charger might be a good idea too. Yes, a phone charger is super important. And uh, another item that you would very much like to have is a copy of all your important documents. Um, if you're tech savvy, you can save all your important documents to the cloud, which would uh, have more room in your backpack for other things. Or if you're someone who likes to have things on hand, print out copies of your insurance, of your renter's insurance or mortgage insurance, copies of your birth certificate and medication should all go in there as well. Because in an emergency, you need to prove who you are sometimes. So it's important to have copies of your identification and what makes you you. So that's also something very important to include in your bag. And also there's special considerations to include as well. So do you have any dietary needs? Do you have any medical needs? Anything you need to be yourself included in your bag. I know someone who includes Twizzlers in her bags because she said, hey, I need Twizzlers to be happy. So that's what she has in her bag. Um, and on a more serious note, I know people who keep all um, EpiPens in their bag as well in case they need they have they need to go in a hurry and they accidentally encounter something they are allergic to. So whatever you need to be you is essential. And pets and service animals, as I mentioned before, pets and service animals are allowed at shelters, and they also need their own go bags. So I have a pet. I have a cat. His go bag has some cat food in it, and he's kind of the rest of the go bag because he fits in a bag. But there he has his essentials. If you have a dog, get them a little bowl in their go bag and keep some dry food. And animals are members of the family and as such, they need their own go bag to be treated as such. Uh, one suggestion here is photos that uh, could be helpful, um, perhaps in like identifying people. Yes, photos would be great as well. And also photos can be a source of comfort as well. I know someone who keeps a picture of her niece in her go bag because her niece is cute and it makes her smile. And another aspect of gathering supplies is having an emergency supply kit. This is different than the go bag, as I mentioned, because a go bag is used for an evacuation. A supply kit is used for when you stay at home. Like emergencies that I mentioned before that you stay at home would be typically weather-based emergencies, such as snowstorms or heat waves when you're unable to leave your home. We encourage you to have about seven days worth of supplies in a stay at home kit. Um, items in this bag are similar to your go bag. However, you may want to include bigger items that you wouldn't necessarily put in a backpack. For example, you can put heavy sheets in this bag, I mean, in your emergency supply kit, whereas in your go bag, you can't really do that because space is an issue. Um, as we see here, there's a bunch of items that you can include here. Um, some silverware, disposable cups, winter clothing, 
glasses, first aid kit, batteries, a flashlight. Are there any items you guys would include that you don't see on the image here? If you wanna type it in the chat. Okay, I see Joy. Joy, you mentioned water, thermal clothes, and a flashlight. That's correct. Those are awesome things to include in, the, in your emergency supply kit. I see photos as well. Does anyone else wanna drop anything in the Q&A section? One thing I had a question about Kara is uh, this radio that I think is, uh, I don't know that anybody has radios anymore. Is that still important? So yes, you should have radios. Let's say there's a blackout. And if you have a hand radio, you can still be informed despite not having access to your TV. Or if your phone dies, radios don't need to be plugged in for you to hear it. So it's good to have a battery or a hand crank radio if possible. And also I'd like to know a lot of phones can have radio access if you plug in headphones. I know a lot of iPhones no longer have the headphone jack, but if you plug in a, a headphones to a phone, you can get radio signal from there and listen to local networks. Like a cell, like a iPhone? Yeah. Oh, really? an iPhone or an Android or an iPod, if you still have those things like that. Do you need that? Like, do you need Wi-Fi or a... Uh... Um, no, it works like um, you just plug it in and then you should have a radio app on your phone. Really? Interesting. So the next aspect of emergency planning is staying informed. So New York, um, Notify NYC is New York City's free opt-in notification service that allows New Yorkers to receive information about emergency situations and planned events throughout the city and Notify NYC is available in 13 languages, the 13 most spoken languages here in New York City. And this app isn't limited to emergency notifications. You can opt in to other types of notifications, which include significant events, public health events, planned events, major traffic disruptions, public beach notifications, local mass transit, weather updates, regional mass transit and ferry disruptions, and most recently we added in basement notifications. So if you live in a basement, you can receive basement related notifications. And the way to sign up for Notify NYC is by visiting nyc.gov slash notify. And then you can receive emails or input your phone number to receive text messages. You can follow us on Twitter. If you speak a different language, the Twitter handle would be at NNYC and then your language of choice. And you can also download the app. Here is the QR codes if you have an Android or Apple device, as well as a QR code for the nyc.gov link. So I'm going to pause for a few seconds in case anyone wants to take a screenshot before I move on to the next slide. Yeah, I uh, actually, I downloaded, I hadn't had the, this on my phone, but I, when we were, uh, when I was preparing for this presentation, I, I was like, oh, I need to, to download this. So it's super uh, helpful to have that on your phone. Yeah, this is a great app. It's comparable to the Citizens app in the sense that it keeps you informed, but it's much less scary in the sense that it only gives you relevant information. And I also like to plug in that this app is hyper-localized. So you just put in the zip codes you care about and you can put in up to five zip codes and only information related to those zip codes will be shared. So if you live in the Bronx, you will not be hearing information about things going on in Coldney Island. So I like this app a lot. I use it personally. I had a couple family members download it and they like it. They A lot of them deleted their citizens app in favor of this app. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the next slide. Okay, so this video here is gonna recap just about everything that I said today. So I just wanna make sure my audio is shared, which it is. And yeah, please enjoy the video. I got home early for a change, and I remember standing outside under this bright blue sky. 
and the news was talking about this hurricane for days. But from where I was standing, it didn't seem like there was a storm coming at all. My wife Tracy was still at work, Ella was at soccer practice, and my son Joey had gone to a friend's house after school. I figured I had the whole afternoon to myself. Hey, Harold. But my neighbor Sam saw I was home and he yelled out to me. Everyone refers to him as Mr. Prepared. About a month earlier, Sam showed me a supply kit he was putting together for stay-at-home emergencies and a gold bag that he might need in the event that he ever had to rush out of his house during a fire or other evacuation. The gold bag, as he called it, held all the essentials that he needed if he had to leave home in a hurry or for a few days. I remember thinking it was a good idea, but I just never got around to it. Anyway, Sam was packing up his car, and he said I should do the same. Well, the forecast was predicting that the hurricanes would hit hard enough to flood all the houses along the coast, and we had been ordered to evacuate by 8.30 p.m. to allow plenty of time before the storm hit. I suddenly started to believe all the news reports. Sam was signed up with Notify NYC, so he was automatically getting text messages about the storm. Then he asked me, where's your family? And I think that's when I began to worry. I went back home with a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach, but I still didn't want to believe that this storm would hit so hard. I mean, we had been through a lot of storm warnings before, and it just seemed like a bunch of hype. We always came out fine. In hindsight, I should have been paying more attention. Because the next time I looked outside, the weather was threatening. My wife and my daughter got home, and I reassured them we'll be safe if we stayed inside. My son was supposed to be home by 4.30, but by 5 o'clock, I still hadn't heard anything from him. I tried calling his friend's house, but by then, the local phone lines were all tied up, and I couldn't get through to anybody. We were all worried about Joey, and I felt like I needed to go and try to find him but I couldn't leave Tracy and Ella alone. There's nothing worse than knowing that your child could be in danger, especially when you know that you could have prevented it. The time to help Joey was months before the storm. I could have made a plan with him about what to do in an emergency, who to contact, where to go. That one conversation could have made all the difference. It must have been around 8 o'clock when emergency workers knocked on our door and told us we had to go. Now, I still hadn't heard anything from Joey. The hurricane was approaching and the storm surge would flood our home. We left with nothing but the shirts on our backs and headed for a bus station so we can get to the nearest shelter. We were lucky. Very, very lucky. We were cold, tired, but we made it to safety. And my son? He made it to the same shelter with the family of the friends we had been with. Seeing him was the biggest relief of my life. I just broke down. At that moment, I promised myself I'd be better prepared for future catastrophes. We were thankful to be in a safe place, but that first night of the hurricane shelter was rough on the kids because we didn't have any clean clothes or any activities for them. And when you know it, there was Sam, Mr. Prepared. Each person in his family came with their own go bag, and they had extra clothes, blankets, toiletries, snacks, books, and games for the kids. And Sam was nice enough to share, which made a big difference for us. When we were finally able to return home, we found all of our windows broken and a lot of flood damage. We lost almost everything in that hurricane. We were able to repair the damage eventually. But there were photos and documents that we can't ever replace. 
Now, we keep those things, the plastic crates, elevated off the floor. And we keep copies of our most important documents in portable, waterproof containers that fit in our go bags. Part of being prepared also means that we have a plan. Everyone in my immediate and extended family knows about it and knows how to execute it, including the kids. We know our evacuation zone, and if this ever happens again, we'll know when to go and where to go. Our plan A is to stay with my best friend Rick. He has a house in the Bronx, located in a safe area well outside of the evacuation zones. Plan B is to head to the evacuation centers. All of our family members know to communicate with us through social media and to call my brother Vic in Denver. Having an out-of-state contact can allow us to pass on messages, even if local phone lines are busy. My family also knows to check the Office of Emergency Management's website for information. And we're all signed up for Notify NYC for fast and reliable emergency updates. Now my neighbors call me Mr. Prepared, and that's a good thing, because being prepared is the best way to protect my family. Um, that summarizes our video. Does anyone have questions for me? Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A portion. I'll give you guys like 30 seconds to um, write it down. Yeah, that was really helpful, Kira. Yeah, I always love this video. I feel like it drives the message of preparedness home very well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and especially just in recent, uh, it's a couple of weeks ago or so, you know, flooding. So that's something that is, I feel like is happening more and more. And it's really important to be prepared for those kinds of things and knowing where those evacuation centers are and having some kind of plan of where your family will meet in those, those cases. Yeah, the city hasn't been experiencing much more extreme weather lately, which is why we keep advocating for emergency preparedness, making a go bag and knowing where to go. So having the bare bones of this presentation can really help you guys all in the long run. So please, please ask me any questions. There's no such thing as a silly question when it comes to preparedness. So please feel free to ask away. I think sometimes now, like these days, we feel a little bit of a like a false security of having our phones all the time and being able to get in touch with people. But I know even from like my own experience, sometimes in, in the past where we've had emergencies here, um, in the blackout of 20, 2003, I think it was, and we couldn't get through to anybody. So because all of the lines were, were so busy. So having like that kind of uh, old school plan um, is is really important. Yeah, when lines are busy, that's why earlier in the presentation I mentioned it's important to have at least two points of contact, one in the city and one outside the city, because when local lines are tied up, if you live outside the city, you are not in, within the local lines ecosystem, so you can make phone calls. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, Shannon, is there anything else you'd like to address or ask me on behalf of the audience? Um, I guess just in terms of uh, you know the information that you need, and this is something like we work with our clients on is kind of creating that portal or a uh, or a, a Google Drive folder or something like that that. Uh, to have all of that information and, and and some of the other things that kind of we think about the healthcare proxy, making sure that you have access to that uh, power of attorney, um, information about your insurance uh, is is important as well. Uh, if you need to access to your homeowner's insurance, making sure that that's readily available, um, and. And often what we'll do is kind of work with clients to make sure that somebody else has access to those things as well, whether you know it's the emergency contact, maybe it's the emergency contact inside New York City or outside New York City, um, that, that they have access to those things. So kind of just from the legal perspective um, and financial perspective, kind of like making sure all of those things are in place as well. 
Well, I'd just like to add, if you are on any medications, it's very important to know what prescriptions you're taking. Pharmacies will distribute emergency supplies of medications. So if you ever leave your home in a hurry and you're out of your medication, if it's a high blood pressure medication or arbutyrol, if you have asthma, if you know your prescription on hand, they can fill out the, the um, they can give you an emergency supply right away. Versus if you don't have your script on hand, you have to call your doctor, which they would then have to call the pharmacy. And anyone who's on medication knows the process is tedious. So having the information on hand really helps speed up the process when you need your medication ASAP. Uh, some of those questions, um, is it recommended to take pictures of documents and keep them on the cloud? I don't, I'll just answer that question that I, I generally think it's a good idea to do it um, because that way you can access those that information, even if it, it becomes a lot more difficult when there is an emergency and you may not be able to get to uh, the place where you need where those documents are. Yeah, so I, I also recommend keeping things on your cloud if you're comfortable doing so. And additionally, having everything written down somewhere is great. If you just want to write things down in a notebook, that's phenomenal. Or just printing copies out on a printer is great as well. Whatever is most convenient for you to access your information when you are disconnected from a device. I also see another question from Sophie it says, is it a good idea to maintain a phone line? Um, having a phone line is still good and relevant. My grandmother has a phone line. Um, I That's the only way I can talk to her. And uh, whenever there's an emergency, I am always able to reach her through the phone line. Okay. I see uh, an anonymous attendee. The question is, any tips on encouraging folks of an older generation that the importance of emergency preparedness? Sometimes I encounter resistance because they have already lived through X, Y, Z and don't need to change. So at emergency management, we have a lot of emergency preparedness programs geared towards older adults. Um, the best way we connect with older adults is by making things personal. Um, basically, a lot of older adults um, are a vulnerable population, one due to age and one due to medication. Sometimes it's very easy to just ask them, what would, you, what would happen if, you, if the power went out and you're and you have you can't use your oxygen tank what would happen that gets them thinking and like okay maybe i should prepare even if i did survive sandy 10 years ago i wasn't in the same predicament as i am in now so the more personal you can make something that i find people are more likely to be reactive and preventative in the events of emergencies shannon and you can also uh like make it about you <laughs> <laughs> just because if they're really resistant, maybe they could say like, it just makes me feel better. Even if you don't feel like you need it, like I can't sleep at night because of it. So can you please, can you please do that? And we have an emergency. We just did our emergency planning and um, we, we want that your emergency planning to be included in ours. So sometimes that can, can help. Answer that, Kara, about the landlines. So, is there? Is there a situation where landlines or cell phones will work? Um, this could happen if your cell phone just dies, and the only thing available is your landline, since landlines don't really die. So that's like a phone that you can have that's always, as long as it's not a breakout and power is still running, you always are able to use that phone. If landlines are tangled up, I mean, if local call lines are tangled up because of an emergency, eventually things will slow down where you can still make the calls that you need. With a cell phone, once it dies, you're kind of at the disposal of how accessible you have a charger. So having a landline is very beneficial. Yeah, and I think sometimes if the, the cell phone towers are overloaded, that you may have better luck with the landline. Um, any other questions? 
Um, otherwise, we can, Yara, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, I have nothing else to add, but um, feel free to reach out to the Ready New York team if you would like any future presentations or if you have just follow-up questions and things of that nature. I'm going to put this in the chat. Are you Were you guys able to see the information that I put in the chat? Uh, I, know I reposted chat. it as an answer, so sure. you also have it, see it in the answer. So I'm dropping in the email, which is readynewyork at oem.nyc.gov. So please reach out if you would like any questions answered or if you just have, if you would like an event for your immediate community or things of that nature. And we will also put that information that you shared in a follow-up email uh, with the recording of, of today's presentation. Well, Kira, thank you so much. This is really helpful. I think that, you know, just having seen that video and just you know, the, the things that we need in a go bag, all of these things just starts making us think about uh, kind of making a plan. And I think sometimes we just, it's just never at the top of our mind of the things that we need to do. So, uh, so I think this is a good opportunity for, for everyone who is on the presentation to uh, to take stock and put something in place for their family, just in case that there is an emergency, they'll be more prepared. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining. And um, we will send a follow-up email and you could reach out to us or to Kiara uh, if you have any follow-up questions.